Okay. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Caravilla from Product Marketing at Quick. Uh, Hans, thanks for joining us. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll quickly talk through a little bit of an agenda that we'll have. Obviously, our topic for our discussion today is safe and secure uh, customer experiences. But what I was thinking about doing in terms of an agenda is, is starting with some, some, some of our learnings around use cases, the challenges we encountered, some of the background on, on the tools that we'll build, um, and then I'll deep dive into hallucinations and, and maybe talk about some of our tactics. And then I was thinking that my colleague John would uh, go into an interactive demo and maybe we can do a lot of the questions and answers there um, so that we can have it be more, much more interactive. Does that sound like a plan? To me, it does. I like okay, it. great. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So um, hi again, everybody. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I'm from Quick, um, and I work on product marketing here. Um, we're a conversational CX platform, uh, which means that we help enterprises build um, AI assistance to put in front of their customers. Um, and for questions that are not resolved with these assistants, we also help human agents handle the rest of the customer journey through a, a AI powered workspace um, that's really built for digital. So uh, thanks again for help, uh, having us come and talk to you about this. We've learned and built a lot over like this crazy last year with AI. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you today. Um, and conversational design specifically, and I have a background in, in digital messaging and remember interacting with the practice. It's such a huge part of the customer experience industry. Uh, and that's why I'm also here with my colleague, John Anderson. He's a conversational architect, formerly a conversational designer. Um, conversational design is, is evolving in this new era. And maybe we can really get into that spicy topic um, uh, in a discussion at the end. And I think John is probably best place to um, uh, contribute to that. Um, and, a, and a little bit more about John, I think he'll uh, probably be quite humble here. But uh, as we went into this unknown battlefield that is AI, he was the infantry. He was the first soldier um, that went into this unexplored space so did uh, and, and built a lot of our best practices around it. So excited to have him on. Okay, uh, let's get started. So just to start this talk, I thought I'd frame up uh, some observations about how we've seen businesses thinking about deploying AI. AI is disrupting a lot of industries, but I think customer experience, customer service is like the first frontier and, and a huge beneficiary of this technology. Something very interesting has happened. I think like customer service in general or customer experience has traditionally been thought of as a, as a cost center and, and really not the place you'd go for with, for innovation. And now I think what we find is like CEOs everywhere are looking to CX and CS leaders and therefore maybe conversational designers for thought leadership on how they should be thinking about AI overall. So um, just a really interesting macro level trend. Um, and I think that's new and we're all getting used to it. Anyway, so some of the patterns that we're seeing here is not surprising. I think businesses think about a lot when they think about AI, like where can I as a business uniquely add value? Where should we build versus buy, safety, et cetera. But like if we had to really summarize, it's down to like two simple things. How can I use AI to have impact on our business? In customer experience, we see that as saving costs, improving your experience, growing revenue. And then how can we do that like really quickly with less effort? So I have like a business school 101 graph over here on the y-axis you have impact. I think there's a debate about human in the loop um, and whether you should have that with your AI. And there's some real concerns around safety. So we'll talk more about that. But I think at Quick uh, specifically, we focus on trying to make experiences safe enough to put in front of customers because the impact, as you can see, depending on, on the types of systems you connect is much higher there. So on the x-axis, we have um, effort um, and that's typically correlated with, you know, the amount of data and systems that you have to integrate. And I think like 
a lot of businesses are maybe trying to begin their journey balancing these two considerations. So as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, a lot of them obviously start with, you know, customer facing assistance, at least uh, our customers, um, maybe with a traditional FAQ self-service uh, uh, powered AI experience um, and try to put that in front of customers. So, um, so that's just a, a, a little bit about identifying use cases. Um, I'm going to go in and talk about uh, adoption. You know, at Quick, I think with this technology specifically, enterprises are adopting new this new technology faster than anything we've ever seen. I think it's because they see line of sight into applications. And I think that's really reflected in our business. I think we have probably one of the largest uh, base of live generative AI assistance in market, both, and generally we, we think of it as customer facing versus uh, maybe internally and agent facing. Uh, we've got a, maybe about a dozen or so live and dozens more uh, in the pipeline in the coming um, literally months. And enterprises are deploying across a wide variety of use cases from improving like search in their digital experience to like completely generative assistance for self-service. And these outcomes that you're seeing tie nicely into what I talked about before, you know, service related outcomes like 70 to 90% CSAT scores, tripling self-service rates to sales outcomes like uh, 2X intent to book and 50% improvement in qualifying customers. So the outcomes are really nice here. I think like there's a, a lot of businesses are going through maybe like a crawl, walk, run approach. So we expect this type of impact to keep compounding as they connect more and more systems, activate more use cases. Um, and, and that's going to be like really exciting. So this is just super early results and it's, it's pretty meaningful um, given how early it is. Okay, so that's awesome, but it's like really not without its challenges. And they're really, for CX specifically in our experience, um, it's come down to kind of like four big themes. The first by far, foremost, you hear it all the time, hallucinations, hallucinations, solution, hallucinations. Um, we want to mitigate hallucinations. We want to make sure our answers are not from the internet and from our company information. I think ChatGPT and its popularity as a consumer product in the early days before people understood like how to leverage this technology, it was confusing. And they thought they would get like a similar experience where you'd have an assistant that's like, you know, talking to you about um, information that it's already knows. Um, we've got much more sophisticated techniques now and we'll talk about that later. Uh, secondly, building these assistants uh, is not like building traditional software. I think this um, group knows this better than anybody because you guys have been working with conversational applications for a long time, but it's an interdisciplinary science. And we've had to talk to a lot of businesses about that. You need conversational design. You need this new role that is the prompt engineer. You need systems engineering. You need business uh, uh, analysis. All of this stuff to make uh, an assistant uh, successful. And given that we have to deploy these assistants in channels where customers are actually communicating, these assistants therefore sit at the intersection of two things, the AI itself and then customer experience. So you need all of these like messaging capabilities to make it really successful. And messaging channels have evolved, right? They're not just like if you go on WhatsApp or Apple today, you have a lot of interactive UI elements. It's not text only, you've got voice notes and uh, it's a much richer channel um, than before, which is why it's got such a large consumer pool. So as a business, you need to like, we try to encourage them to like think about that. And then finally, of course, you have to think about performance. Um, I think there's a trap right now with all this LLM excitement that everyone's focused on like, how fast is the LLM responding? And like, what's the token count? But really in the end, we're trying to achieve goals uh, with our customers. And so you need to keep your eye on the ball. Um, so um, I'm gonna frame up, we, we went through all of these challenges. I'm gonna frame up the life cycle of actually building one of these things um, because I think the life cycle talks 
uh, n uh, talks to us nicely about the capabilities that we need at every stage. So, um, you know, the typical software life cycle is maybe like build, test, deploy, and improve. Um, I think with these AI assistants, we have one very interesting uh, pre-step. Um, when you've charted out what you want your experience or assistant, we call it assistance because chatbots are dead, right? Um, when you want you, you want to chart out how your assistance is going to function, the first thing you usually need to think about is what data is it going to consume? Uh, and the use case I talked about before is that, you know, a lot of the times customers are starting with connecting these assistants to a trusted data source, like your knowledge base. A lot of the time, um, that knowledge isn't perfect and it needs to be collated across the organization and prepared and transformed for this like assistant. It's the foundation, right? And your first step to making sure that this assistant is like not referencing something um, that's outside your, your own trusted source. Then you have to think about building it. I think, you know, conversational design as an industry has standard, standardized around visual workflow for good reason. I think it tackles complexity really well around how to design conversational components. But in addition, we think it's useful to actually have that overlaid with connectors into CX systems. So you'll see that later in a little bit. You know, I, I think this is like split up as things have gotten more specialized because like people may do some of that design work in a specific design tool, some, like even something like Visio, and, and then export that for system engineers. I think there's a lot of value to bringing this together because with AI specifically, you need to iterate super fast. Um, and it means um, that it has cascading effects on multiple things. Anyway, um, this also means that a single pane of glass where you have like multiple stakeholders, you know, the art, which is conversational design and the engineers, which is a science, like kind of working together. Um, and you need the tools to like also connect and prompt LLMs all while building like this assistant, right? And then you've got to think about connecting them to rich messaging and human handoff and all of the CX um, capabilities as well as uh, data models, because in the end, you might want to measure different points in the journey. So thinking about this whole thing end to end is like really critical to success. Um, given that all of this stuff is new, let's go into testing, because I think this is like super interesting. Um, sometimes a small change to like a prompt can have like cascading consequences. And you need to be able to reference like what's happened, what element you changed, where in that assistant that happened, um, and you need like a robust testing suite. It's like a critical piece that I think we've seen is really missing and not focused in terms of from a tech stack perspective. I think some people are now calling this like conversation observer, observability, which is a handful. Even I'm struggling to say it, but it's just testing in my, my mind. Um, and then finally, you need to measure and improve. So we talked about speed and accuracy of these LLMs, but then of course, talking about business goals. So holistic, think end to end, this is what we mean. Okay, uh, so we went through all of these challenges. We had all of these capabilities that we needed, realized that it didn't exist or were fragmented across like 15 to 20 different tool sets. And so we put it all together. Um, and we call that um, AI Studio here at, here at Quick. Excited to show you. But I want you to keep these four boxes in your mental mind as John goes into the demo, because I'm also going to segue into hallucinations next. So we'll walk through these boxes and describe a little bit about the capabilities of AI Studio. The first, we have um, AI resources. I talked about some of the challenges with loading and transforming your data, but this will help you chunk uh, append, aggregate, um, and restructure your data sets so that it's really optimal for the LLM. Uh, you've got um, the next box, which is the flow designer, which is a traditional, I think, more traditional work, a visual workflow environment. But uh, in our world, we've infused it with AI and CX capabilities. And that also has a companion environment we call the function editor. Um, which is a purpose-built environment for prompt engineering and working with these LLMs. So that's the second box. The third box is the workbench, which is the testing suite. 
Um, that helps you view LLM responses. You look at simulated uh, conversations so you can iterate on the prompts. Um, be really exciting when you guys actually see it. And then the fourth box is insights. Uh, so reporting on um, how LLMs are interacting with your resources. I think we're going to talk a lot about um, a technique we you know that's well kind of established now called RAG or retrieval augmented uh, generation and we'll maybe even be able to look at some of the sem uh, semantic similarity search stuff that we do. And then of course, there's also funnels and goals, which has been a um, something that's a carryover from traditional conversational uh, design, which we think is still useful in this, in this new world. Okay, so that was a lot. That's actually a, um, a, a, a tee up for John a bit later on. I'm going to deep dive because this topic is about safety and security. So I want to deep dive on hallucinations um, and just help you help share our worldview and and talk a little bit uh, about our, our tactics that we that we use. So I want to deep dive on that now. Um, when we think about hallucinations, let's get on the same page on the definition because I think that traditionally hallucinations are just thought of as one thing, like is an answer truthful or not. Um, and I think we take a very broad view on what hallucinations mean. Uh, these four principles that you see up on the screen, accuracy, contextual, relevance, and, and clarity are actually borrowed from cooperative principles of communication formulated by a philosopher, Paul Grice, and are, are foundational to thinking about meaningful conversations. And I think like we define hallucinations um, by telling you what it's not, which is the violation of these four maxims. And I think the most important by far is one in three, right? Answers need to be accurate and relevant, obviously. But some of the stuff is more subtle. Like you don't want an assistant to like belabor the point or be super unclear. So we'll be able to see some of the stuff uh, live. Okay, let's talk about um, how we address hallucinations. Um, Imagine a, you're interacting with an assistant and a question comes in, what happens in the assistant and its brain where, and before an answer actually comes out? So we'll talk about um, how an assistant works. Um, and I think it's a useful framework for thinking about safety. So um, think about it in three big areas. Uh, so we've got customer communication channels here on the left. A question comes in. What should we do when a question comes in? Um, so that's part one. What should we do when we try to find the answer and actually generate it? And then what do we do after an answer is generated, right? Um, and there are techniques to mitigate hallucinations at every step. So let's start. Um, so the first thing is that our architecture here, and this is what's really interesting, I think, for conversational designers, it's resource-based and it enhances the ability of our assistant to tackle like many more types of questions and is way less brittle. I think there's an ongoing conversation about this. Do we um, move to a resource-based model versus trying to make maybe existing in intent models marginally better by using LLMs to like identify intents? I think it's a very robust conversation to have um, and maybe we can tackle that in the Q&A. Um, but even before we look for an answer, right, we actually use multiple LLM calls to establish scope and agency for the assistant. So um, in, we're still classifying maybe intents and topics. We're checking for things like sensitive nature. Um, and hopefully we can talk a bit more about that in John. But here we're actually using the um, LLM to establish scope. Um, we're looking at the question seeing what information is actually needed and whether that information's even there. Then we are probably checking for relevancy versus relatedness. Sometimes, you know, as you look up answers, they may be closely re related because, um, you know, they're framed similarly or use similar words, but they are not, you know, they have different um, scores in terms of how relevant they are to the actual question. So you might have to tune your prompts so that you actually offer more context to get that relevant answer. And our assistant is um, 
you know, lobotomized, which is, you know, I, I guess, a medical term for, for cutting off part of your brain. But what we're trying to say is that it's only scoped to conf, um, company information, right? Uh, I think some folks in the industry call this grounding, um, uh, but it's it's super important. Um, we, as you look to the information sources on your right, as you're bringing them in, you know, you need to do a lot to enrich and transform um, those potential answers so that the AI or your LLM can actually find them. And uh, that's a really, really important step and a core part of our um, what our AI resources actually does. Um, because a lot of these data sources were really built for humans. They were not built for AI. And so I think there's like a whole translation uh, that we need to do to make sure that it's AI ready. Um, let's go into language, uh, actually generating the answer in the natural language generation. Um, in some cases, you may not even want a, a generative answer. So uh, we try to blend in a static responses. You want to make sure that you're ref referencing truthful information. So we even cite resources to offer to um, the cons consumer. Uh, now the answer is generated. We do a series of super specialized checks to validate the veracity of those answers. We do a final set of checks to make sure like um, no further clarifications required from the user and we're rechecking for, for scope and tone. And then we push an answer out. I think the key thing that I want you to take away from this whole flow is that hallucinations is not addressed by just one thing. You have to take care of it at every step of building your assistant. And it's critical, right? Um, so you, you try to execute uh, every step that you can. Um, this was a lot, and it was me talking a bunch, but I hope that this is uh, a useful framing for what my colleague John is going to go and do next. Um, so we're going to go to the demo. John, I'm going to stop sharing and let you take over. Great. That sounds good. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share here. The uh, I, I'll introduce myself a little bit. So uh, as Thomas said, used to be a conversation designer. Uh, now I would say conversation architect. Uh, and there's there's a subtle difference, right? Like over the last year with LLMs, I've learned that I'm not so much designing a very specific flow or exact messaging, but what I'm doing is I'm I'm providing structure and a framework to use these tools to to build that conversation. So uh, I think of it as an expansion of the role, and it's been uh, the way the way I often describe myself to when I get on customer calls is I get to talk to LLMs every day. So I actually uh, enjoy doing that. I have a lot of fun doing it, and it's one tool in the tool belt uh, of a conversation architect. Um, so. The goal, right, in these conversations is to provide accurate and efficient answers uh, to users. So we want those grounded in truth. Um, and, and so I'm gonna just show you very quickly here, a tool that uh, I use up front is we we will now have a, uh, a knowledge source of, of one kind or another, but let's say it's a, an FAQ from your website, right? And maybe we scraped it. Uh, and so here I can see that I've got a bunch of HTML tags in here. Uh, handing this to an LLM and asking it to answer is is a little bit difficult. It's not it's not super readable to you and me. And then even we've found that when you when you hand that to a to a language model, it, it can be a little confusing, right? There's a, these tags in there. It, it generally understands, but we can make it better. Um, and so what I want to do in this very first step is I want to take this data, and I want to get it into a format that's going to be really useful for me to use in the assistant. So uh, through a series of LLM calls and some some uh, programmatic calls, I can transform this data. I can you can see I stripped out the HTML tags. I added some additional data. I enriched the data in a way that's going to allow the assistant to answer better. So I can pull out things like um, th those tags. Sometimes we have customers that have at the end of every help center article, it might say sign up for our newsletter. I don't, I don't really want the assistant to have that information because it's going to finish every answer with sign up for our newsletter for more. So some, some kind of obvious things like that, where I'm pulling out data, um, it can, I can isolate individual topics and I can kind of provide that as an additional field within this data. It's all, all as a means to improving the data and enriching the data in a way that's going to make the uh, the assistant have better access to or like know what information to access in, in, in answering. So let's uh, jump over to this is kind of the the exciting the fun part. Uh, not that that's not fun, but this is this is more fun. 
So here is our visual flow editor, right? So this is uh, at a high level. I know you can't read the, the names of the nodes and that's fine. We're gonna, um, this is more just to show you that at a high level, I basically fr flow from left to right. So previously, uh, what this might look like is a, you know, these are defined flows where I'm going from here up to here. And so we still have some defined flows, but they're not necessarily a defined flow in that if you say this, I'm going to say this. It's more of a, if you say this, I'm going to ask you this question or this type of question or try to gather this type of information from you. If you're looking for an order lookup, I need to know what you, maybe your name and your zip code or your name and your order number or whatever that might be. Uh, so I'm going to go and I'm going to, ask for that. Whereas if you ask about, you know, how much delivery costs, maybe that's a more general answer. I'm going to go hit a, a knowledge base and, and um, answer that question accordingly. So, so John, John, can I say yeah. like when you started a project, because this is now there's a lot here already. So if you're working with a new client, how do you like how much is going to be here? What's that first step of, of deciding how much is going to be there? Yeah, so uh, I will do a probably about this area here mm -hmm. is a general template. And so we're going to start the majority of customers or anybody who's building is going to start with something very similar to this. And then these additional parts out here are going to be more customer specific. So you might build some additional flows depending on the use case, but you're going to have, uh, if we talk about RAG and the fact that we want to hit knowledge and answer questions and safeguard those answers, it's, it's generally in what's uh, highlighted in blue right now. Cool. Yeah, because how do you make that decision of rack versus then regular? Or are you coming to that later? Uh, I would have a hard time building an assistant these days without some rag, just in terms of, I think, it, like, certain if you came and you said, we need to do this very transactional flow and we don't have any knowledge that it needs to answer, that that's totally fine. Uh, I think that everybody probably has some knowledge that at least, at least you could think of it like this, where you come in and if you have an assistant that's only doing order lookup, but somebody asks, uh, like, do you have, like, where's your store located? Maybe you want that as just a backup answer. Maybe that's not the purpose of your assistant, but you want it to be able to answer contextually. Yeah. Maybe you have some information. Um, so I actually think of, this might be a little bit unusual, but uh, knowledge answers are RAG, but order lookup is still RAG, right? I'm still getting information. I'm retrieving information and I'm using it. It just happens to be personal information or, or account level information instead of general knowledge. Um, so I, I think probably everyone, or I don't know, 95% of use cases would start with this and then start to build out some some additional pieces uh, de depending on their use case. So at a high level, what, what's happening here is you're coming into the assistant, we're setting some fields, we're sending a welcome message. Uh, and then this, this node right here, this classify question, I'm gonna come back to it because it's doing a lot of heavy lifting uh, up front. Let's say that you're asking a general knowledge question you're going to come in, we're going to route, this is just a router to determine where you should go based on some fields that were set previously. Uh, I'm going to try to do, I could talk about this for hours, so I'm going to try to keep it higher level. Uh, I can certainly answer questions at the end, but what's happening here is that we're going to go through this flow where we're uh, in, up front in the classifier, we're doing things like inbound message filtering. So if you come in and you ask, you know, why is the grass green? Uh, very innocuous question here, but like it, we don't want to answer that. Right. So if you think of it in terms of if you ask something that's offensive or just way out of scope or anything like that, we don't want to answer. We don't want to kind of waste the time putting you down this flow to not get you an answer. So we can route that out. So we do inbound message filtering. We do classification. What are you like? What's your question about? What kind of topic? Are you a customer or a prospect? Can we identify you? Um, is it a sales or a service type of question so that we can route you accordingly? We're doing all of that up front in this class. And I'm going to jump back into here in just a minute. Um, after that we're going to flow, sorry, do we, do we have a question? No, no, I was, I was waiting for you to finish. I'm interested, like why you sort of basically sometimes have eight different prompts in one note rather than just maybe have yeah. one very detailed one or, or why you're switching up the different columns. Yeah. And... It's a great question. So here in this classify node, when we're up front, you come in, you ask a question, uh, when can I pick up my order? We're going to come in here and I'm going to run, what is it, eight eight prompts at a time. Um, and so I'm not doing one and then another and then another and another. So that's how you tend to think of a, a prompt chain. Um, yeah. If I zoom out here, this is from kind of like from here all the way through the end is a 
a prompt chain, but it's built with a series of parallel prompts. And I think that's a, a key learning that we've had uh, in using these is these parallel prompts, uh, what, what, what I would call atomic prompting. And what I mean by that is I'm giving the LLM a very specific task. I'm saying, is this a sensitive topic or not? Uh, is the topic one of these 10 topics? Like which of these 10 topics is it? And I'm not, I'm not putting those together into one prompt. And I'm not saying like, hey, tell me the topic and whether it's sensitive and whether it's an order inquiry and you know these additional things. So if you think of it in terms of, if you're talking to a person and you give them five questions and you just read off five questions, uh, personally, I'm not gonna remember more than maybe two, right? As I start to answer, not that the LLM can't remember, but it does a lot better job, way more efficiently. If you give it eight different things to work on, these are all independent of each other. So we go out, you ask the question, we go to the LLM eight times right here, right up front, and we get back eight answers. I set fields based on those answers, like topic field, in or out of scope, whether it's sensitive or not. Um, and then I can route the conversation accordingly. So, yeah. And then I guess you might, for one specific task that you give the LLM, you might find that one LLM is performs way better than, than a different one. So you might use that for that one specific thing then. Exactly. So like here, uh, this one happens to be using mostly GPT-35 Turbo 1106. Uh, and there's nuances even between the GPT models. Uh, and you kind of, as, as I said earlier, like I talk to LLM, so I kind of get to know them. Uh, I know the strengths and weaknesses of one versus the other uh, in, in a general sense. But this one here is using GPT-4. Um, but I could just, I can open this up and I can choose from any number of LLMs. So some of them do better with different things, right? So I, the other day, uh, had a prompt that I was working on. I was using GPT, I tried three, five, I tried four. Um, I ended up going with Haiku and it just does a better job at particular tasks. So uh, the, the flexibility to be able to use a different model within the same assistant, right? I could use all of these models in the same assistant. It doesn't matter. And to the user coming in and, and typing my question, I, I have no idea that you're hitting different models. It doesn't matter because we're doing all these safeguards uh, and all these checks to make sure that what we're doing is providing you with the answer that you need. So uh, the, the the multiple LLMs is a, a tool in the tool belt to be able to kind of get that the most efficiently um, that you can. So once we do this classification, we're gonna run through these additional steps. So say you're in scope, you're on topic, you're not asking something that's sensitive and we need to kind of bump you up to an agent or whatever. We're gonna uh, get, we're gonna start to go out, we're gonna search the knowledge. We're going to filter down that, that relevant versus um, related, not necessarily just because a, an answer or a source of data is related to what you said is not necessarily relevant. So we're going to use some prompting to filter that down. We're going to generate an answer. And then after we generate that answer, we have a variety of techniques that we use to check an answer before sending it to a user, right? We have we know about this hallucination issue. Uh, we don't want to just trust that even once it's grounded in truth and we've given it good data, we want to verify that it's correct. Uh, so we have a verify behavior, uh, a different type of node here that we that uses a purpose tuned model to check for factual consistency. Uh, so that's one of the tools that we use. We can use a variety of other tools to to check again uh, before we send it to the user. Check whether the answer is on topic, in scope, uh, all, you know, not sensitive. All these things. Once we check all that, we approve it. We send it out to the user. This all happens in a matter of a few seconds, uh, and then that way we can be sure that what we've sent is both truthful and accurate uh, as efficiently as possible. So I'm gonna just show, this is just a chat uh, a chat panel here to show uh, a sample conversation. So I'm gonna let it come in here. Um, and then I'm gonna just say, so I'm, I'm, I'm interacting with a, uh, like a mountain bike store, right? So I might say something like, uh, I don't know, I have a few questions. Uh, let's see, does it, Assembled, can I finance it and do charge sales tax? This is the most efficient user in the history of chatbots. They've asked all three questions at one time. Uh, and I do this on purpose because previously with this kind of prior gen NLU, you would have to either disambiguate or try to answer three questions from what, like you have to identify an intent. Here, I can, I can identify that we're talking about three separate topics. We're going to need three separate pieces of information 
and I can answer all three questions at once as though uh, as though I'm an expert in the subject and I and I know. So I right, I've answered. It's fully assembled. We offer financing and it probably yeah, and sales tax. Um, and then I follow this up with a link that's relevant to what you've asked. Um, and so there's a lot going on there, right? We're running. We ran through that entire pipeline. We answered three questions. We checked them for truthfulness and accuracy, and then we delivered them along with a link that's relevant to the question that you're asking. Um, and then if I said something like, I don't know, how long will it take to be ready for pickup? Um, it's going to go ahead and do, oh, I, I, I typoed there, but it should do uh, just fine. That's the other, I mean, you know, the, the benefit of the LLM is it's trained on human language and it's human language is full of typos, right? Um, but what I want to show, the part that uh, really, really gets me as a conversation architect, conversation designer is I can come in here and I can see in this replay of of what just happened. I can see the transcript over here of the conversation. I can see the um, the user question and the answer, the link that was sent. But then if I come in and do, let's just look at, these are all my prompts. Those eight prompts that we saw earlier, this is the this is what went out to the LLM for one of those. And this is what came back. And the reason that this is so powerful is that if I change my prompt, I can replay it. And I can get, I can see what it does before publishing it and putting it live and putting it in front of customers. I can replay an event at any time. I can see what's changed, what's the same, and I can start to work on my prompt. So then if I open this up, I can see here what the the differences are in my um, in my LLM calls. So I can see different things like which articles were picked up. If I change my knowledge base, if I uh, if I have different prompts, I can see the kind of what happened in, in the original and what happened in the replay. And that's a really powerful tool for me to be able to compare and see what changed over time as I, as I develop and iterate through. Yeah. Um, if we look at this one, also, so you might change a prompt, but this is also an instance where you might then decide at one point that you want to change the LLM that you're using for one specific prompt. Yeah, exactly. This becomes an ongoing game of like figuring out how to, yeah. What That's a fun job, end. everybody. That's the job yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you change your prompt, you change your model, or you upgrade the model, right? Uh, OpenAI deprecates a model that you're using and you need to upgrade and you know that's coming. You you upgrade your model and you you start to run through these and see that things are the same. Um, and we'll get to test sets in a minute that really help with that. But John, if you could, um, yeah. if I can interrupt, the, if you can go back to the previous screen, I'd like to show also the articles you pulled up. Um, um, yeah, so as as you can see over there, there what's also returning is the search results. So which articles, how closely related they are, and the score associated with that. And so sometimes you may identify a problem even with the source knowledge, and you may want to tweak that, or there's like some contentious articles there. So it might not be problems with the LLM, but actually maybe things you might want to yeah. fix with the data itself. So it's both sides, which I yeah. want to call out. That's really cool. We're we're working now also on developing more content around information management because the way we kind of look at it is if you've got your total number of conversations, then a part of that can be automated with a chatbot. And within that automation, you have like your RAG potential, your RAG scope, and that is dependent on the quality of your information. It's basically like if I walk into a library and the books aren't organized, it's very difficult for me to find the book I'm looking for. But if it's properly organized and labeled and tagged, then it's easier for me to find the information that I need. And it's the same with LLMs. And that doing that well, that discipline and information management helps with the potential of RAG. Yeah, absolutely. And so like we can sync these data sets, right? So that they're ingesting every night. And so maybe maybe the customers put out three new help center articles and now that like the answer has changed because we're now pulling different data for that answer. And we can come in here and see that and, and see, you know, why an answer might be different now than it was previously because yeah. we have automatically syncing data. Um, and so we're hitting different articles. Yeah. Um, it might be different, but it might still be good. Yeah, exactly. It, it might be different. Yeah. Probably, like hopefully it's better, right? Like hopefully yeah. what's happening that during the course of being live for a month, you've identified gaps in the knowledge, right? We have reporting. We're going to, uh, anytime that I'm unsure of an answer or not as confident, I'm going to go to a particular node so I can build a report around it. 
that we just call it a flag node. And then I can present those conversations. Uh, so this is where it gets really, I can present those conversations to the customer and say like, hey, here's a bunch of transcripts where we weren't able to provide a definitive answer. So this is where you have a knowledge gap. And maybe that knowledge gap is like, oh yeah, that always needs to go to an agent because it's too complicated. Or maybe that is like, oh yeah, we should build an article for that. Um, I can also take those transcripts and feed them back to an LLM and start to identify the, the particular knowledge gap so somebody doesn't have to read all those transcripts. So there's a, a push and pull there too with the ability to use the LLM more than just customer or agent facing. That's kind of like, I don't know, that's an LLM, LLM facing LLM, right? Where we're, yeah. uh, we're able to use the language model to, to uh, help identify and, and supplement the knowledge gaps. Um, if I look at this one particular prompt, uh, I, I have... I have notes for what I want to get through today. I'm not going to get through all of it because I want to leave time for questions. Uh, but what I want to highlight here is we're looking at one atomic prompt, one prompt that we've given the LLM, the language model, a very specific task. And we're just saying like, hey, based on this question, is this customer pre-sales or post-sales? Because, and there's going to be a, different, a bunch of different reasons. Maybe pre-sales, I'm hitting one knowledge base for answers. Post-sales, I'm I might need an API call to look up their order or to look up their account information. Uh, if they do end up needing to be handed off to an agent, maybe I have two different groups of agents. So this this one particular prompt is doing a lot of lifting in terms of like, are you pre-sales or post-sales? And then a bunch of decisions can be made on that uh, going forward. So, so if I look at that, I'm getting uh, pre-sales here. And then a really, really powerful tool is to be able to take this and I can add it as a test case and then let me show you, I've, I've done that before the call here. I've got test cases. I've got 10 here. I'm just going to click this button. What this is, is this is 10 real conversations that have come in. I've looked at them as the conversation designer, conversation architect. I've looked at them and I've said like, okay, do you offer financing on new bikes? That's pre-sales. Uh, I busted my derailleur and I need help with that. Like that's post-sales. But what if I change, like what if this bike store starts to add tours as a third a third kind of arm of the business. And I need to change my prompts for now. It's not just pre-sales, post-sales. Maybe it's now it's pre-sales, post-sales tours. Um, but it it can be hard, right? I know that I know that I'm guessing that there are people out here on the call today even that are using spreadsheets for here's my prompt, here's some answers. And you're kind of like you're looking at it all the time and you're trying to figure out this it's really hard to look at a prompt and look at an answer and decide, like, yeah, that's that's great. Um but, but what I want to do is I want to be able to update my prompt for this new arm of the business. And I want to make sure I haven't screwed up anything that I've already built that's working. So I've got these test sets. And so I can look in here and I can say, yep, the inquiry type is sales. The inquiry type is service. I can hit those 10 test sets. Those are all running against the LLM every time I hit this button here. And I'm getting 10 green check marks. If it was if it failed, I'd get a red, and I would know what I need to do in order to go in and and maybe it's changing logic or changing a field that's being set. Maybe it's updating a prompt. Um, there's a bunch of stuff you can do, but these test sets give you the confidence to as the designer that the assistant is doing what you want. But it also gives you the confidence to be able to hand it off to a business user or to hand it off to a customer and say like, yeah, I'm I'm like it, I am confident that it still works for all the stuff that we've defined previously. Plus, Hey, look at this new test set that we built out for the tours or whatever else. Um, and yeah. we can condition off of those. It's cool. Cause you see a lot in a lot of our clients as well. It's like, Oh, this is working great, but how sure can we be? And it's like, yeah. You know, and, and a lot of people just argue, but here it's like, no, look, this yeah, is very exactly. clear. This is working. This is how confident we are. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can get it. You can get it in production because everybody's doing LLM in a basement somewhere. Until yeah. they, I bet with quick, you can now actually, you know, talk to your stakeholders and be like, let's deploy this with great confidence. Yeah, there's a, there's a problem, I think, with prompting um, where the question, like, why is the grass green? I can very easily tell you, like, don't answer the question. Why is the grass green? But I have way overfitted that prompt right now. That prompt is not generalized. And so like it's it i fixed one problem i fixed one user utterance but i didn't fix anything else so then like maybe it's still not catching stuff that's out of scope so these test sets help me build mm -hmm. prompts that are generalized and specific uh and then be confident that i'm you know 
answering them correctly. So I use test sets all the time. Uh, it's it's a super powerful tool because it helps me uh, kind of retroactively make sure that nothing I'm changing is is changing outcomes that I don't want changed. Yeah. Um, and, and in the same way, I know we talked about RAG. Uh, I, I would show further examples here of in, in, in an actual conversation, but here, this, this answer is all general knowledge, right? But if I came in and I had a post sales question of like, when can I pick up my order? I recognize it's a it's a post sales question. I'm going to need API information. I'm going to need order information, account information, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch the knowledge base I'm working on. Uh, I'm going to go out. I'm going to hit an API. And I'm going to pull that in. I don't know that. Uh, I don't. I don't frequently see that called RAG, but truthfully, it is right. It's just different mm -hmm. information that you're using that you're retrieving and augmenting your answer with. Um, so I can do things like that where I where I hit different information in there, uh, which can be really powerful. I know we've all seen demos of like how contextualized answers are. So if I said something like, you know, I need my son to come pick up my bike. Previously, we could just have an answer about like bike pickup and time availability, whatever that might be. Now we can say like, oh, when your son comes in. So we're using that contextual conversational part of the LLM as well, while grounded in truth. Uh, that can be uh, really, it makes it a, a much more pleasant interaction uh, as a user. So I think I got through most of what I want to be able to show, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I could, yeah. I, I said, I could go on for, for hours to show you all the nuance part of this. Uh, it's a, it's a really fun, it's, it's really fun to be able to work with an LLM and be confident that what you're doing is being measured uh, in ways that you can, you can work on rather than just kind of like going to chat GPT and asking a question be like, oh, that's a cool answer. Yeah. But is, like, can I, can I repeat that? So that extreme observability that Thomas mentioned earlier is kind of what the tool is built around. Um, and, and just the fact that you can see everything that's happening, you can see exactly what's going to the language model and what's coming back. So you can condition off of it. Yeah. I mean, for me, my takeaway here is really like that you're not just doing generative AI. It's like you're using, like it's sort of like an umbrella and just how many LLMs are actually working in one system and how many checks there are. And like, there's not just like, oh, you use an LLM for that. It's like, no, that's, it's it's a concept almost. And there you have all these atomic building blocks that then once you start doing that, so properly, you, like you just build in so much confidence. So there's that part. And then there's like organizing the information that you have internally and then doing a very clear check and where, you know, pulling from the right data source with yeah. all these checks and balances in place. And then I was yeah. like, you kind of de-risk the entire operation. Like it becomes so detailed. <laughs> yeah. Like, like to your point, this is, so I would say this flow editor here, like what I'm doing here is not designing. It's not even necessarily building. It's orchestrating a conversation. I can use LLM calls, API calls, business logic, conditional routing. I could use traditional NLU in here if I wanted. Uh, I can use static messaging if there's a need for it in a particular instance. I can do all of that. Um, so I don't know. I know there's hot takes around like what does what do LLMs mean for conversation designers? Is it a role that's going away? Uh, I don't know. Maybe you could say conversation design is dead. I, I would say it's just not it's it's more than just design now. It's it's a larger role yeah. and you have more powerful tools to build even cooler, better <laughs> examples of it. Um but I would say it's probably not just conversation design anymore. It's it's design and architecture or design and guidance and 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 all of that, um, which I find very yeah. exciting. Yeah, no, I, I look at it the same way. It's like if you have a very limited understanding of what conversation design is, yeah, it's it's probably going to die over time. But it is, you know, taking ownership and and having direction for figuring out how you want the system to talk to people, right? And then now you've got way more tools and resources and and things that you can use to do that. And, uh, most of our people here, it's like, because everybody's talking about this, that they, could, they say you guys are like definitely like six to 12 months ahead of everything now. And it's just, it's so cool to just see it work so well. Uh, it, it's really impressive. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's conversa conversation design is this thing. Everything now, is, like conversations are either gone or everything is conversation design. Right, like, I think, right. And of yep. course, we're in the second camp with that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if there are any questions. Oh, I see some Q and A. People are properly putting that in the in the chat here. That's or in the QA section. Let's see. One of the hardest 
uh, part of CXD with LLMs is maintaining brand tone. Did you build a prom just specifically for a brand tone or how do you manage this? Yeah. So in general, what I would say is there's going to be a few prompts about it. Just like we try to prevent hallucinations in a number of ways. We're going to uh, we're going to give the LLM a system message. So system message rather than just a user message gives it a little bit more guidance. We're going to tell it the, the tone that we want to take in a conversation. And then we're going to let it generate an answer based on that entire pipeline that we talked about. And then we're going to check the tone. We're going to tell it again at the end, like here is the persona or the tone that you are operating within. Is this answer good within that? Um, so we're going to do it in a couple places to, to make sure that we, we get what we want there. And then another one, how often would you recommend reviewing the content once it's all up and running? I don't know if that's done referring to either the, the information itself, which is an ongoing process of maintaining that or the stuff coming out. But I guess you kind of showed already that it's an ongoing thing, right? Yeah. So what I would say is um, that's going to be business dependent and, and probably it's going to be a little bit more uh, intensive up front when you launch it and you see how people are interacting. We can all test, but we test differently than people actually use it. And we find that every time uh, when we launch an assistant that real people use it slightly differently than testers. Uh, so upfront, you're going to do it more often, but we've got a reporting tool set where I can build in a dashboard that monitors conversations. So I can go in and I could look at it every day if I wanted. Um, I could look at it probably in the first two to four weeks after going live. You're you're going to be, I mean, we found people are very interested in their LLM assistance, right? So like, you're probably going to look at it every day, to be honest. Uh you're going to start to see things. And then I think that important part is to remember that perfection is not the goal here, but truthfulness and accuracy is. We're looking to do this more efficiently than a human can do it, but we're not looking for perfection. Like no, if you have a help center agent, if this is all agents, right? No agent is answering every question hundred percent. So like have a little bit of leeway and seeing what is or isn't something that you need to fix right away. Um, so so yeah, I think you you look at it frequently up front and then over time you're probably looking at it like every week, uh every couple of weeks, every month as you start to get uh real settled in there. Yeah. Then we see does quick offer classes. I know we're talking about like we're also creating like some content, a nice module for people at CDI to learn about quick and, and get that out there. But it probably you're helping customers yourself as well with like onboarding and, and things like that and doing that properly as well. Yeah, um, uh, classes. I like we've done, we've done some some initial s stabs at that. Uh, I don't know, Thomas, if you have a a better answer than like, kind of. I I think I think I think right now we we don't have a, a curriculum, um, but I, I suspect that we will be working on on things like that in our future. Um, we are hyper focused right now on very large enterprises, and therefore. Um, but as we as we learn and scale up, it's definitely something we're evaluating. But I guess part of like this here today is also already education and stuff. There's another yes. one here that I, I like that too, but how collaborative is is quick. Thinking of getting approvals from stakeholders, how might it be simplified for them, you know, for easy understanding? Because for us, this is super exciting. But I know like Someone in someone on the a board member is going to be like, yeah, this does not. What is this? What am I looking at here? So how does that work? And like collaborative in terms of where, like I I work with um, both customers and colleagues here at Quick every day on these. So uh, the 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 tooling set works very well in a team environment. Um, there's reports to set up. There's data transformations up front. So it kind of depends on the structure of your team. Um, but even the, you know, the other conversation designers or architects here, we're, uh, we're working together to, to prompting is really fun and can be difficult. Uh, different perspectives are useful when you're thinking about how to talk to an LLM. So the, the tool allows you to, to work uh, uh, collaboratively in there. Yeah, and, and I would also say from some of the work that I've seen, like large multinational organization in different markets with different languages, they work with quick. So, so you can't do that if, if you know, you don't have this thing sorted out. So I think this is basically like, sometimes quick seems a little on the radar, but that's because they're busy working with very large companies. So, that, so the, the complexity there and the stakeholder management uh, is, of course, very important. So all of that is sorted out very well.
I, I don't think it's a, a, anything different from what traditionally happens when you're deploying applications in a sense, Hans, because I think if you think about stakeholder management, maybe let's split them into two groups. You've got the working team, which tends to be your designer, maybe your engineer, um, maybe even a product manager that's like involved in the digital experience. What we're finding is with the working team, they might all come into quick and we've got uh, logins and they might all look at um, the single pane of glass. So, and, and you know, things like our testing suite, they want a visibility, they want to touch the programming, right? That's the working team. Um, I think you've also described a leadership team. And I think the leadership team, what we found is, you know, traditionally organizations will do a UAT test. So we'll deploy it um, somewhere on a website and they'll do a bunch of tests um, and they'll run questions and answers and you'll basically go through a normal testing cycle. Um, and then obviously from there, you build confidence within the organization, especially with their leadership team, that this is yeah. something that they are willing to, pull, to put in front of customers. So that's your general process that we've kind of seen um, when deploying with the organizations. John, let me know if I missed anything, but I think that's like my learnings. Yeah, no, that, yeah, you, you nailed it there. Let's see. And then the last one, and we're basically at the time. I was going to round up, but somebody snuck a last question in there. What skill set should a conversation designer have to enter this field? Are the skills of a product designer transferable? Uh, this is a great question. So I will say this. I've never been a product designer, so I'm not going to try too hard to speak to uh, exactly what a product designer is. But I would say, are you, uh, to me, the skills are the ability to think through questions, uh, to kind of have an open perspective on how you want a conversation to go and see conditional logic and conditional routing are super important, right? So I don't necessarily uh, do any programming, but I can think about it in terms of programming a little bit, like a, like lightly um, in how I want a conversation to be routed. Uh, so I think that the skill set is uh, like curious, interested in language and how a an LLM works, how that language model works in terms of like, I, I give it something, it gives me something back and, and realizing that's not deterministic, but that it's it's generative and it's going to be a little bit different. And so trying to rein that in. Um, I think some of the same skill sets that existed a year ago for conversation designers are still very relevant. Uh, it's just that maybe it's a, you could, you could take it a little bit more technical now, um, but you can also have like technical people on the team that supplement that. So so I think there's still uh, a, a large role for conversation designers and it, and it's still a broad spectrum. I meet conversation designers all the time that have very different backgrounds and very different skill sets. And I think that all still plays well. Yeah, I think you need to be like, at the end of the day, it's like the conversation that a customer needs for that customer to be successful. There's not a lot that's changing in that. So then you need to be able to recognize what makes a good conversation, like what helps these customers. And then it doesn't really matter whether someone's maybe writing that into a declarative intent-based bot or that you need to make sure that it's coming out of an LLM, that it's properly generated. So if you care about delivering that conversation and helping customers or, or employees or whoever's interacting with this chatbot, then that's already a great starting ground. And then some people will be a little more technical. Some people will be a little more creative, come you know, with a writing background or just as a customer support agent where they kind of work their way up into these AI teams. Yeah. Uh, all right, so so it's time. There's a beautiful link, everybody. You should click it and you should check it out. And that, that's really fun. And also... We've learned about buying mountain bikes. If you ever go to Bozeman, Montana, it is beautiful there. Get yourself a mountain bike. And what you yes. guys maybe don't know, my son, his name is Zeal Gallatin, and he was actually named after Gallatin County and the there Gallatin River. So, yeah. if you uh... Very. We did not know that. That's a very interesting fact. Um, yeah. But, yes, um, I, I, I want to speak to uh, maybe some of the conversational designers that are uh, maybe working at some of the enterprise businesses um, um, that you guys work with all the time. If you found any of this stuff interesting, um, you can navigate to our website, quick.com forward slash AI slash um, hyphenated studio uh, slash. Uh, and we're opening up for customers there. You can click a button right in between. Um, 
uh, for getting access and someone on our team will will contact you shortly. We're just started uh, testing out a new onboarding flow uh, so that you can folks can easily get started. So uh, we're super happy about that. Um, I also want to leave with uh, my email as well as John. Uh, feel free to find us on LinkedIn or send us an email if you found um, any of this interesting. And we'd be happy to take any further questions. So that's our email as well. Cool. Uh, Hans, I just want to thank you and the CDI team for having us. We very much appreciate this. Um, I think it's awesome that an organization like yours uh, even exists. Um, I see big things for um, you know the future of conversational design. Super excited about it. Obviously, we have a bunch to here that um, with with folks like John, um, and I think you know the future is bright. So, you know, in this new world, it's going to be really exciting. The future is bright, and it's great to have you here. It's been it's been too long. We should have done this, but yeah, we've we've got a great show here today. No, thank you so much, and we love working with you guys. For everybody, this is, this is really an amazing platform that you want to get your you want to get your hands dirty and play around with it. So, get in touch with quick, and go to Bozeman and get yourself a mountain bike, like definitely. <laughs> thank you very much, team. All right, thank you, everybody.